Hey guys, it's Delora Davils here and I just got home from work and it was a really slow night at work. So my makeup still looks good. So I figured while I was still all dolled up, I'd go ahead and do a book review for you guys. This is one of those good news, bad news books. The bad news is it's out of print. But the good news is, is that the Kindle edition is only $15. I do have the Kindle edition because I purchased it first. Uh, it took me a little while to find a hardback edition, but I was able to find one on halfpricebooks.com for $30. You might check out Half Price, Abe Books, Etsy. Sometimes Etsy people will sell old books, and especially magic books. So you might be able to get your hands on it. Don't pay too much for it. Someone on Amazon is trying to sell it for $250. Don't do that. Don't give them that money. They are poachers. Anyway. I only paid $30 for this one. So to get into it, Patrick Dunn is very good. That's why I went ahead and I did the book review of the Tarot and Lenormand book because I could not wait to finish this one so that I could talk to you guys about this one. This one is really, really fantastic. I wish I had found this book years ago. I'm like, ah, where has this been my whole life? Because this it corroborated, again, a lot of the things that I already believed. It gives a lot of good information that you can chew on and think about. And it's also very, very beautifully written. Patrick Dunn is a beautiful occult writer. So there's this one highlight that I really like. Like art, magic is not subject to scientifically controlled repetition because it deals with the subtle states of self, mind, and holistic reality at the point Oh, at the moment of the act of magic. Sorcery is utterly untestable, which is fine. It doesn't have to be. So a lot of times people try to make magic into a science and it's not because what works for one person doesn't work for another person. I feel like a lot of ceremonial magic rituals try to do that. It's like, oh, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and it should work for you. But what Patrick Dunn talks about repeatedly in his book and what I am like, yeah, is he talks about the importance of aesthetic. How what is aesthetically pleasing to you is going to bring potency and power to your magic because it, it everything is about symbols and symbolism and symbol systems. So if you have a certain aesthetic that you that you like, like I have more of a not necessarily goth, but like I have an aesthetic Right? And there are certain decks that I like. That's an aesthetic. That's part of the aesthetic. right? Certain tools, I like for my tools to look a certain kind of way. That's the aesthetic. Whenever I use my tools, I'm so excited because they look so nice and I like the way they look. Then there's power in that because you're speaking from your heart. right? Aesthetics is it's kind of like a primal thing that's a little hard to explain, but you know when you like something and you know when you don't. You know whenever you see an art style and you're like, I need that that tarot deck or that artwork, right? And you know when you're like, I'll pass. And that is very powerful. Whenever you use those tools, you're setting a certain aesthetic out to the universe, right? So the universe is going to talk back to you in that aesthetic, right? And you're going to find it a lot more fulfilling and you're going to understand that aesthetic a lot better. Now let's say you don't like a Greco-Roman aesthetic, right? Like, you know, think about the pillars and the architecture and the, and, and the symbolism and the mythology. But let's say that you're working with those symbols, but that's not the most aesthetically pleasing system to you. Whenever the universe talks back to you in those symbols, it's not going to mean as much to you. So it's best to work in aesthetics that mean the most to you. I love how much of an emphasis he places on it. He says it nearly constantly throughout the book, <laughs> right? Let's get into the table of contents because his table of contents is very much like um, self-explanatory. So you can read the chapter and you're like, okay, I know what this chapter is about. Oh, hopefully this isn't washed out on camera. No, okay, good. All right. And I wrote my own um, list of exercises 
because I love the list of exercises in Matt Oren's Psychic Witch book. I mean, there are like so many exercises in that book. He needed to have a list, but now I'm spoiled. I want a list of exercises in all my books, even if I have to write them down myself. So as you can see, I have tabbed a lot of things. These are the exercises I like. These are the topics that I like, right? So Patrick Dunn talks about the three skills you need to be a magical practitioner. That is imagination, introspection, and authority. And throughout the entire rest of the book, he brings those back up again and again and again so that you're building those skills throughout the book. It's not just something he mentions at the beginning and then doesn't mention again. Everything feeds back off of itself and he's very consistent uh, throughout the book in what he says, right? So there's not a lot of contradiction and there's not a lot of haze, right? Nothing is hazy or like, mm, well, what did he mean by that? He's very explanatory. He may even be a little redundant at times, but whenever it comes to writing a book on magic, I don't think you can be too redundant. You want to make sure that your reader really understands what you mean. So you might need to say it two different ways so that you make sure that your reader understands exactly what it is that you're saying. Um, I really like his work on sigils, right? So symbols, signs, and sigils, that whole chapter is all about that, right? And uh, he talks about, uh, I think he talks a little bit about automatic drawing. Yeah, because he talks about, you know, finding a sigil in a page of scribbles. So you think about the intention and you scribble and then you circle out a piece that you find really aesthetically pleasing. And that piece that you took out of the whole page of scribbles, that small piece of scribble is now your sigil. And he talks about the importance of how once you forget the sigil is when you really know it's transmitting, right? That the whole process of getting a sigil to work is to eventually forget what the sigil means. And I didn't know that and I think that's a very interesting concept and I've heard other practitioners say that before, right? Um, yeah, and again, he uh, he talks about talismans, and he says, I make my talismans as pretty and weird as I can. And I highlighted that because he's talking about aesthetic again. If the act of magic does not aesthetically affect the mage, it's no more than a dead routine. I love his conviction there. And you can agree or disagree. That's what I like about reading books, you know. Um, I really like his list of magical tools. It's not comprehensive, but he has like, he has the air dagger, the athame, and the sword as all different tools, right? He makes a distinction. I feel like in a lot of books, anytime they're talking about a sword or a knife or anything, they just call it an athame. But an athame is very specific to certain traditions. I know it's specific to Wicca, and I know it's specific to some other um, practices as well. Anyway... He's got bells listed, candles, uh, a grimoire, drums, cups, everything, uh, incense and stuff. It's really, it's really nice. I like his taxonomy of spirits because he, he talks about friendly spirits and not friendly spirits, amicable, fr amicable spirits and inimical spirits. I'd never heard the word inimical before, but apparently it's the opposite of amicable. And what he says is one person's amicable spirit can be another person's inimical spirit. There's so much it like as as easily accessible as, as it is, right? And as easy to learn as he makes it. He also throws in some very deep things like that into it that gets your it gets you thinking. And he talks about what I like is that he calls them powers. He doesn't call them angels. So planetary spirits or powers and angels or powers are a certain level of spirit that is very powerful, right? So he calls them powers. And I like that he calls them that. I kind of, I, I like that terminology. It resonates with me. It's pl aesthetically pleasing to me, more so than angels are. Um, and he talks about gods and egregores being different things. And he talks about how to work with egregores. And as you go through the book, 
more and more things about egregores will pop up. But more than giving you a taxonomy of spirits and how to classify spirits, he also tells you about ways to identify spirits, how to test spirits so that you know that they really are who they say they are. Very important because spirits are just like people. They lie, they play pranks, and they will try to use you for their own end or just to toy with you. Just like people can be manipulative and usury, spirits can be manipulative and usury. So just like you're not going to be friends with anyone you meet on the street, it's the same with spirits. And I like when practitioners really make sure that beginners understand and know that. Like not all spirits are your friends. Um, he talks about making a servitor, a servitor, which is kind of like an egregore, but just you. So not an egregore, but it's an artificial spirit that you create to do your bidding. So a lot of times whenever we do spells and I realize it's like, oh, that spell, technically I was making a servitor whenever I was doing that, but I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Right? It was just something that I instinctively did and now I have a name for it. Now I understand what I'm doing. I'm creating an artificial being. Right? And he talks a lot about different artificial beings you can make. You can make a teacher. Right? And eventually your imagination stops and the magic starts. And I really like how he talks about this. He mentions this a couple of times throughout the book where you know you set the scene with your imagination but then the scene takes on a life of its own you imagine the spirit and you build up in your imagination this spiritual teacher or this teacher right and then eventually the imagination stops and the teacher takes on a life of its own the spirit takes on a life of its own and he talks about that national projections and i love his chapter on astral projection um it it is very easy to understand and he tells you just how easy it really is to do that kind of work and I love to do it because it is easy. Set some drum beats, clear your mind, you know, light some candles, whatnot, set, get your aesthetic straight, turn on whatever meditate. I like the drum beats, a lot of people like the drum beats. Um, and just sit there and wait. Just sit there and wait, <laughs> you know. Maybe visualize a scene but then eventually the scene will take on a life of its own and it's really just that simple um and he talks about the different things that you might see in the astral uh he talks about the astral plane has weather let me read this Storms in the astral plane can be whipped up by a large number of people suffering considerable anger, rage, pain, or hate. After a large natural or man-made disaster, for example, the astral plane suffers wild storms in all three realms. These reflect not only the pain and suffering of the mage, but the pain and suffering of all those harmed by the disaster. It is best to avoid these storms by not venturing into the astral planes until the issues causing them are resolved. Right? Um, <clears throat> he talks about actually exploring a symbol. Right? And so he talks about building an inner temple. And if you want to explore a symbol, like maybe an element, right? You want to understand the element of earth better. Or you want to understand the direction of north better. You're going to go to your astral temple and you're going to write on the door the symbol and have the, you know, the, the intention of going to that area of the astral plane, right? And whenever you go through that door, you'll go through that area. And if you're ever lost in the astral plane and you're like, mm, I don't know if I'm in the area I want to be in, he talks about tracing the symbol in the air, right? So whatever element you're using, tracing it into the air and either the, um, your journey will become more crisp or it'll spit you back into your temple. Uh, Christopher Pinchak talks about building an astral temple as well. So that's a pretty uh, popular thing. 
He also talks about an anchor, which is something that Matt Oren mentions. He only mentions it very briefly um, at the beginning of his book, Psychic Witch. But he talks about how he has a hematite ring that he will remove when he does his psychic work. And that is a gesture, a magical gesture to signal his brain to go into alpha. When he takes off the ring, he goes into alpha. When he puts it on, he exits alpha. That is called an anchor in Patrick Dunn's work. And he describes how to do it in detail and how to practice it and all the different ways that you can make your own anchor. And I really like the, the crossover. because so whenever multiple magicians use the same techniques, that's a nod to me that tells me it's a pretty good technique, right? And I should definitely give it a try. I already have, actually. I like my uh, anchor quite a lot. But the other thing that I like that he talks about in here is magic in the street. That whole chapter is amazing, especially as someone who works for tips. Being able to glamour or otherwise, you know, manipulate people. We manipulate people all the time. And I like Patrick Dunn's um, non-judgmental way of talking about this, right? We speak in certain ways. We dress certain ways. I work for tips, so look at my makeup. I'm completely gussied up, right? Because I want people to tip me because I'm beautiful, I'm pretty, and I smile a lot at work. In fact, I smile a lot at work so much so, whenever I come home, my cheeks hurt. Cause I'm, I always have the, you know, the retail smile on, right? Because I'm putting forth that thing. Well, a glamour is exactly the same way, except you're building up an astral image, right? Or a magical image that other people will instinctively pick up on, but not really see right? Um, I like that. I like that a lot. And he talks about, you know, using that as ways of doing that and seeing the aura and all of that stuff. I really, he says some really, really amazing things. And I'm going to skip the divination chapter. And we're going to talk about, oh, he talks about performing acts of power to build power and authority in yourself. So even if you're don't even need to do a spell for something. Do a spell for it anyway. And use a statement of power to build authority, right? Even if you wouldn't really do a spell for it anyway. If we only do spells every now and then for really big things, right? We're not going to get the practice that we need. And I like that he talks about that and building authority, not just building authority in ourselves and confidence in ourselves, but building authority to the spirits in the world at large around us, right? Spirits will take notice of you. He also talks about the Holy Guardian Angel. I love the way he talks about the Holy Guardian Angel. All in all, this book is really great. I'm trying not to ramble too, too long because it's an excellent, amazing book. But he also talks about magical groups and he mentions magical attack in the magic in the street chapter, but he also mentions it more in depth in the occult networking chapter. He talks about different kinds of occult magic and different groups you can find, how to deal with people, some magical etiquette such as don't touch another magician's tools uh, if, without asking. And because a lot of us wear our tools and have our tools on us all the time, don't just go touching anything that belongs to a magician. It could be a tool and that could be perceived as, rule, as rude. Little things like that he talks about. Um, and he talks in depth about how to fend off magical attack, which is great because not a lot of books cover that. And it's very important to cover that, especially among beginners. And uh, what else? He talks about different archetypes that people fulfill in magical societies. He also talks about the dangers of being out of the broom closet. Now, I feel like in the last two or three years, it's blown up even more so than it already has. I feel like in the last 10 years, there's been a, glad a gradual shift to paganism. And in the last two or three, it's been like, boom, there's a spike, an even bigger spike, right? But I like how he talks about um, basically everything that you would need to know about being a magician. Um, everything is in here. And like I said, I really like what he has to say. He talks about egregores and how to use them. And that is a concept that you don't see a lot of occult authors talk about with 
uh, a lot of knowledge and practice and experience behind it, right? That's why I got an entire book about egregores by Mark Stavish, right? Because I want to know more about it. And so I love whenever I find books that can cover a lot of ground very quickly and very thoroughly without using really vague speech. Patrick Dunn is a beautiful writer and he is straight into the point with everything and I can't say enough good things about this book. Again, it's probably going to be more accessible to get the ebook. I hate ebooks. So I got the ebook and I used it until I was able to surf around and find a hard copy at a decent price. And luckily, this one didn't have any writing in it yet. It's all me. So <laughs> I hope that you're able to find a hard copy if you want one. I'll be sending you good vibes. And I really hope Llewellyn you, Llewellyn, reprint this book. This book is amazing. And the fact that it has not been reprinted since its initial printing in 2005 is an absolute fucking travesty considering all the trash Llewellyn has been putting out lately. No offense. You've been putting out trash lately, Llewellyn, and this is some good shit. Reprint this good shit, right? Okay, I'm off my soapbox. I hope you guys enjoyed this book review. If you did, please hit like and subscribe to my channel if you've read this. Please tell me everything you think about it in the comment section down below and we can have a good little conversation. Uh, I do have an Instagram. It's Delora underscore dabbles. So if you want to see what I'm up to in between videos, they do a video about once every week or week and a half. I'm a little sporadic. Um, you can definitely keep up with me on Instagram and you'll know what I'm up to. So, and if you want to see my knitting and my cats, Instagram is the place to go. So until next time. Happy dabbling and bye-bye.